Hi, I'm Hannah. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. In the last bunch of videos, I don't even know how many, I've put a Google form so people can ask me questions just like a more organized way and I'm gonna do my first ever Q&A video. So, let's start. The first question that I actually just noticed on my channel, it's on the Google form. I made a few videos, I'm drinking coffee, so I went and asked if the coffee at Dunkin' is kosher or like, what the situation is. So in that particular video, it wasn't Duncan, but doesn't matter, the same answer applies. Any coffee that is just black coffee, no flavorings, no nothing, is kosher. I'm not sure what it is, what it's like in other countries. So in America, that is the rule. If you're traveling outside of the country, do some research. Number two, so my coffee order is an iced caramel latte with almond milk. So I check the caramel syrup. I just ask whatever coffee store I'm in, I say, hi, can I please check the caramel syrup to see if there's a kosher symbol? And sometimes people will be like, oh, there isn't one, or they'll be like confused what I'm talking about. So even if they say yes, I like to check on my own because how do I know that they know that what the appropriate symbols are and what the symbols that I hold by that are widely accepted, etc. So I just ask, the people have always been really nice about it. Usually they're just confused and they're like, okay lady here, and I'll check if it's kosher or not. And then I don't really eat dairy, so I drink almond milk and I'll either ask to see the, the carton of milk, of the almond milk, or if I notice the brand and I know that it's kosher, then I'll do that. Now I'm gonna be reading questions from my computer. So if you see me look down, that's why. This question, more send videos. Love hearing about your experience as a public high schooler. Was it hard for you to fit in? Did you know people going into STEM? Was it hard that everyone had certain backgrounds or knowledge that you didn't? Okay, I've been wanting to make more STEM videos, but I just feel like I'm so removed from seminary. But if someone has like something specific that they want me to talk about, I'm happy to do it. I just don't know how to make or what contents to make one whole video about seminary. But I'm happy to if someone wants me to talk about specific things. There's a bunch of parts to this question. So was it hard for you to fit in? No. In general, I have a pretty easy time relating to people, making friends, etc. I didn't go to a Balt Shuva seminary, so a seminary that is meant just for girls that don't come from religious backgrounds. My seminary is known for having a lot of girls come from public school, um, and that like more Balt Shuva Eve than there were also, especially my year, tons of girl that, girls that came from classic Mount Orthodox households had gone to Jewish school their entire lives, etc. So socially, it was not hard to fit in at all. And I think also the demographic of girls that my seminary attracted made it not hard to fit in. It was definitely, and I think this is touching on a second, a separate part of the question was, it was definitely intimidating coming in, especially because one of the reasons I chose my seminary was because it was known to have a lot of girls come from public school. That generally is true. My year was kind of anomalous. I live with a girl who's a year younger than me that went to the same seminary and she did go to Jewish school her whole life. And she said there were a lot of girls from public school from her year. So that's just one thing. So it definitely was intimidating, but I had a friend say to me who went to like pluralistic Jewish school and then a different seminary. And when I expressed these concerns, I said, Rachel, all these people are coming from Jewish school. I'm gonna know nothing. And she said, just because someone went to Jewish school it doesn't actually mean they know what's up. And I was like, I don't get it. How's that possible? You go to a Jewish school for 12, 13 years and you don't know what's up. It's possible. There is some sort of background knowledge. There was like jargon that I had to learn that now I'm comfortable with, but five years ago or four and a half years ago when I was in seminary, I wasn't comfortable with. So it was definitely an integration process, but I, I would say I made friends pretty easily. And then I just had to get comfortable asking questions to my peers. So the girl sitting next to me being like, what does that word say in Hebrew? Or what's that word the teacher used? Or what? Just in general, or, or asking the teacher, hey, can you please slow down? Do you mind when you write something in Hebrew on the board, do you mind adding in the vowels? Or like, hey, when you said everyone knows this Mishnah, I actually don't know what Mishnah is. Could you explain that? Or everyone knows this famous Midrash, but I actually don't know what Midrash is. Could you explain that to me? So getting comfortable with that and just really spending a lot of my t a lot of time in seminary on my own, just figuring things out. Or I had amazing Madrejo that sat and learned with me, helped me, my really good friend Sippy, taught me how to write in script. She made a chart of print on one side, which I knew, and script, and I would just transcribe things in my sitter or source sheets or whatever. So it was hard-ish, but I was like very determined. And I think because I cared more than a lot of the girls coming from Jewish school, and I was more motivated, I figured it out. And then the last part of that question was, did you know people going into SEM? Yes, I did. I knew one person, Claire, who you've seen on this channel, not recently, because I haven't been able to see her recently, 
but we knew each other from C teen and we kind of went through the seminary process together. So we went in together. So she was the only person I like actually knew and we were very close going in. There are a few girls that we had spoken a little bit before when we made our group chat and whatever, but she was the only person I really went in knowing, which I like. I'm just that type of person. I know a lot of people will make decisions where to go to college or where to go to seminary based on if their friends are going. I was not one of those people. Same with camp. I went to camp for the first time when I was nine, sleepaway camp. I went in knowing no one. I loved it. So that's probably just a personality thing. Next question. Love your channel. Thank you. I'm Balchuva too. I wonder how you learned to self-study the Parsha. I want to say seminary in general, right? Because it gave me a, a background and knowledge, a basis of knowledge and kind of understanding where things are coming from. I didn't really take a Parsha class in seminary because there was only one offer and it was like a very high level and I couldn't keep up. But I definitely learned Tanakh in general in seminary and every Thursday night we have something called Mishmar which translates to night guard but it's just like a thing to learn Thursday nights and particularly about the Parsha so that was a bit more of an accessible Parsha class to me and that rabbi really suggested like if there's anything that I can tell you to do it's learn the Parsha and the Parsha is split up into seven aliyah or aliyot seven sections that you can read every single day of the week and it doesn't take that long so he really suggested and encouraged everyone, including myself, to read the Parsha. You can read a bit, bit by bit, day by day. It kind of depends on my day, on my week, whatever, if I do that. So I would say that. He also really encouraged me to write down any questions that I had. So the first time I went through Chumash, I did that. I've kind of stopped doing that. But it's really cool looking through my Tanakh. I mean, like, these are the questions I asked and these are questions that I now have the answer to. Or I was like, oh, that's a good question. I should find out the answer. So I don't do that anymore. I learn the Parsha differently. Right now, I'm going through Chumash with Rashi. So Rashi is one of the foremost commentators of the Torah and the Talmud. So I'm learning the Parsha with his commentary. But I would say any like advice I would give to someone, especially who didn't have the opportunity to go to seminary, is literally just read it. Because there's so much that you can get from reading it and you're going to have questions and everyone has questions on the Parsha. And you can look into Torah classes online or on Spotify that can explain the Parsha. The Parsha podcast by Rabbi Yaakov Walby is really excellent. Chabad.org has tons and tons of Parsha stuff. So just like through research, you'll be able to find Parsha stuff that you like, that relates to you, that you can understand, etc. Next question. Do Bali Tshuva, which is the plural of Bali Tshuva, someone who became religious later on in life. So do Bali Tshuva usually marry other Bali Tshuva or converts or does a Bali Tshuva and someone that is from, from birth ever get married to each other? Uh, it doesn't matter. And I don't I don't know if I can speak on what's usual because I don't know, but I'm definitely not opposed to dating Balchuvas, converts, people who are from, from birth, whatever. I think in some communities there might be stigmas, but I think that's stupid. And in general, like, it doesn't matter. You should just marry someone that you relate to, you can grow with, that you, you make sense and you work religiously and personally and whatever, all the other things. I don't necessarily think that should be a consideration. Next question, great video. My question is, is setting up a mezuzah by the garage typical? And it's a few part question, but I'm just gonna start from there. Yes, it is typical. Basically all the sources say that you should, it is typical. Also on that video, I remember on my mom's phone taking a video of her hanging up our mezuzah on the front door. And then when I was editing that video, I couldn't find it. So that's why I showed the garage one. But yeah, that is typical, putting it up on the garage. And then, do you think you'll make Aliyah someday? Yes. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now. You'll find out more in the future. Then last part of that question, who are your favorite from YouTubers? So I've been doing this for three years. Actually, the other day I got a notification from YouTube that it was my, my channel's three year anniversary. And one of the, re I guess the reason that I started my channel is because I didn't see any from YouTubers, especially when I was in high school. So, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I was becoming religious, there was nothing. And then that's why I started my channel. And within the last three years, I have seen a bunch of channels pop up. So to be honest, I don't really watch a lot of YouTube, which I understand is hypocritical because I have a YouTube channel and I hope that people watch my channel. But I really like Jar Fireflies, um, Sonia's Prep. I'll link some below that I know of. Again, I just don't really watch them. Not because I, I think these ladies are great. I just in general don't really watch YouTube, but I can link some below, but a lot more have popped up in the last three years. And then also on TikTok, there's like tons of from women. So that's also popped up in the last few years. Or at least like I really only knew what TikTok was starting in like COVID. So maybe TikTok was a thing before. But in the last three years, 
they're having a lot of from women on TikTok, which is awesome. Hi, what are your plans after college career wise? That's a good question. Figure it out. Um, probably something with Jewish nonprofits and or because they're not mutually exclusive, something with people with special needs because I really like people with special needs or horse therapy because I, fun fact, I grew up riding horses. So maybe something with that. I don't know. I'm really open. We'll see. I'll make videos. I'll keep you posted. Marriage wise, will you use a matchmaker or will your rabbi help or will you find someone on your own with an app or something? Do you think your family not being observant will influence prospective in-laws? Okay, lots of parts to that question. So in terms of the app, I don't know. Dating apps turn me off. I don't have, I've never been on any dating apps, but I have friends who have and I've just heard like horror stories. I also know people who met their significant others on dating apps. And I'm sure it's great and there are like from versions, but I, mm, I don't know. I just, not for me. Will you use a matchmaker or will your rabbi help you? Or will you find someone on your own? Um, I don't know. We'll see. Again, when that day comes, I will update you. I don't really see myself using a matchmaker. I just, mm, I, I don't know if I can really explain that. Watch how like I end up doing that. But where, where, what I'm feeling right now, I want to say no. It just feels like too rigid and systematic. I definitely would date for the purpose of marriage. I'm, I'm not going to date just recreationally because I just don't think that fits into my lifestyle. But I'm definitely not opposed to friends setting me up or mentors or things like that or my rabbi or his wife or, or really anyone. Um, I don't know if I would go through like a formal process. I just like don't think I'm that type of person. And I know that is common in the religious world. And I have friends going through that system. I just personally don't think it's for me. So honestly, I love a meet cute. Okay. Everyone wants a meet cute. But, you know, I, again, I'm down for like friends, mentors, etc. Just being like, hey, I think this makes a lot of sense. Thoughts. And just going from there. And do you think your family not being observant will influence prospective in-laws? Again, this kind of is like the do bought shuvas, marry bought shuvas question or commerce. I I think that's if that's an influence, that's silly. And then maybe that's not the family that I want to be marrying into. Uh, I such an artificial marker. It's I didn't do anything to be born into the family that I was born into. Hashem was like, okay, this is the family you need to be born into. Great, I love my family, and I think if that's a deterrent for someone, I think that's stupid, and that's not someone that I want to be with. That's my opinion. Next question. Is there a sect of Judaism that you feel like you connect with most? I know you mentioned Chabad a lot. I kind of just do my own thing. I am very, very connected to Chabad, both because that's what I grew up with and that's just what my neshama connects with. I really love Chassidus and really learn a lot from the Rebbe, but I don't think that's at the exclusion of other sects, if you will, of Judaism. I think there's wisdom in a lot of things. There's a famous teaching, Shivim Panim Al HaTorah. There's 70 faces to the Torah. So I think you can learn from everyone and I don't learn just once. Like I don't only learn Chabad Chassidus. I, I learn from Rosal Vichik and I learn all these other amazing Jewish educators. And I think there's something to take from everything. I'm broadly in the modern Orthodox world and the Chabad world. And I was speaking to someone recently and I said, you know, I think really often it's one or the other and people in both camps kind of judge the other and really just unaware of the of the other camp. I think I'm very fortunate that I have access to and I am pretty involved in both worlds and I can take what I like and be inspired but what I'm by what I'm inspired by in both communities. So I'm just into the God thing, you know? I do my own thing. What was one of your favorite things about becoming from? I think I was very attracted to the like step-by-step -step small incremental things and I really love the idea that it's not all or nothing. I've been wanting to make a video about this for three years, but haven't. The, like, the way I started keeping Shabbos was I wouldn't play games on my phone. I was still using my phone for other things. But I'm like, I'm very into games on my phone. And I just, on Shabbos, I'd be like, okay, it's Shabbos, I'm not playing games on my phone. I would do a lot of other not Shabbos things. But that was, that was like the one thing. Slowly, slowly, slowly. And I also really love the tradition. I didn't grow up with a lot of family traditions. That's always something that I wanted. And I love the, tra the, the traditions both that Judaism has for you, right? So every Sukkot we eat in Sukkahs and whatever, there, there are these like laws that we follow and they're on a, a calendar basis. But then also like families can have their own traditions. Like I know a family that every Sukkot, they have donuts for breakfast. I think that's so cute. Like is the halacha? No, you can eat whatever you want for breakfast on Sukkot. But I think that's like a really cute thing. And especially like the child led, you're doing things in order to intrigue the children. I think that's a big message of Pesach, but I think in any other holiday, you're trying to intrigue them and pass this down and make it and package Judaism in a way that they understand, you know, at two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, year old understand. So I think that's really attractive. 
And I think just like the timeless wisdom. There's so many times where I learn, I'm like, oh my gosh, how could anyone say that Hashem is not real? It's so obvious. So I would say on, on one foot, the first thing that came to mind are those things. What is the hardest part of being the only Orthodox one in your family? So I just want to say and give my family credit before I answer this question. They deserve all the credit, especially my mom. She's a rock star. When I came home from seminary, she's like, we're costuring our kitchen. The kitchen is to my standards. Whatever hachshirim I want, that's what we have. However we want to hold, that's like, I got free reign. Also, my mom is very cute. Whenever she goes online shopping for me, she sent me a dress and she'd be like, Hannah, I know this dress doesn't cover the model's knees, but you know, she's 5'8 and you're 5'3 and that's five inches. So I, I think it'll cover your knee. So she gets a lot of credit and she makes me my own food for Thanksgiving and we bring my own stuff just to give credit. Okay. I think one of the hardest things is kind of what I mentioned the previous question is not having those family traditions. And I think I especially feel this when it comes comes time for Passover. My family just never did Passover. I always say that Russian Jews are a different breed of assimilated. So there are a lot of people who aren't observing the tr like traditional sense of it. But their families do Passover. And they have family traditions and you know, their their uncle says the, this part of the Seder with this special hat on and this aunt says this part of the Seder with this voice, whatever. I know someone who does like a play. There's a part of the Seder that you retell the story of leaving of Egypt and their family does a play. And one of my roommates or past roommates, her family sings God bless America at the end of the Seder. And that's just like their thing. And I don't have those things to want to like insert into something. So that's hard. But then it's also cool because I can start making my own traditions or during covid i that first covid that first covid pace off 2020 when it was just me my mom my sister for the seder i was like i wanted something funny i'm gonna say manashtana in russian the four questions in russian so i've done that i think every year since and that's like something that started so that's cool did you eat pork before you were orthodox i'm not jewish so i hope this isn't a rude question um i don't think it's rude maybe other people would be offended but i i am fine answering it yes i did but when, even when I was really, really little and had, like, no concept of, like, people can become religious later in life, I stopped eating pork. Um, I was just, like, a decision. I don't know. That was just a decision that I made. I, I don't even remember how old. Probably elementary school, middle school. I don't even know if it was, like, conscious. I just, like, oh, Jews don't eat pork. I'm not going to eat pork. My family did. But I just chose not to. Last question. And really, really, if you ever have any more questions, you can just leave them on videos. You can I'll probably make another Google form or keep the same Google form. You can ask more questions. Really, this was a lot of fun for me. So the last question is, if you plan on marrying someday, would you marry a Jewish man who is not Orthodox? So I do plan on getting married one day. I would not marry someone who was not Orthodox. I have a cer certain set of values for myself and I have a certain set of standards and I don't want to compromise that for a person. And even if someone says, oh, but I'll keep Shabbos for you, I'll keep kosher for you, all, all these things, I don't want it to be for me because it's not for me, it's for God. And I don't want that to have to be a, a discussion. I see couples have to have discussions about their religious life. You know, you're moving in with someone. You need a, there are certain things you need to talk about, but there are certain non-negotiables that like, I don't want to have to think about, okay, are you keeping Shabbos? I think it's important to come into a relationship with a certain standard for your, for yourself and for your spouse. So there are certain people who they could be amazing, but if we're not religiously compatible, I'm not going to go out with them because why should they do something for me? Or why, why should I start doing less of something for them, you know? So I would not go out with someone who is not Orthodox because I want to keep my standards. I want to have a certain set of standards for my household. I want to keep a set of certain standards for my future children. And I just don't want that to have to be a thought or a question. I think it's important to start off a relationship as much on the same foot as you can. Obviously, people are going to be religiously different and that's okay. But I think there's a certain threshold of how religiously different you are and it's also important to me that i marry someone who values torah and is learned and and all these things and that might not necessarily be true of someone who isn't orthodox obviously it could be okay i'm i'm very much generalizing but in a quick answer i would not marry someone who was not orthodox and it's also very important i mentioned earlier that i would date marry a bal tshuva 100 percent but i think it's important that they be religious for a certain amount of time and that they're they're integrated because when you first start reli being religious you're just in the clouds like oh my gosh god and judaism is amazing and that's true 100 percent true but i also think it's important to be like from and normal and integrated and if you're not integrated into the from world 
and things don't become like second nature and you you're just not necessarily as learned or educated i just don't necessarily think that's gonna work for me so as i mentioned i am definitely not opposed to marrying and dating someone who is about shuba but they have to have been religious for a long enough time where again they're they're integrated they know what's up they they know it's fine they can keep up thank you so so much for watching again please ask me more questions the best thing that you could do is ask me questions because i love answering them it makes me think and if you have questions on my questions or questions on the way i answer things really 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 please 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 ask me. Anyway, have a great day. Bye.